The Bible reads, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Now look, Thanksgiving's tomorrow. i, I got to say something. So we're off our regular uh, course of preaching through the Proverbs. I want to talk tonight about some of the, the, the attitude of Thanksgiving that we ought to have and how to behave ourselves during the time of Thanksgiving. And I know that, you know, Thanksgiving time, you know, really what it ought to be, the goal ought to be a time of fellowship with friends and with family, uh, enjoying the company of people you don't get to see all the time, enjoying the conversations. You know, a lot of people will, well, Brother Finn, do you know the real story about the Indians, what really happened? You know, I'm not here to talk about what, you, what happened way back in the day. I mean, that's not very profitable to us today. Um, so that sermon, maybe, maybe another day, not today. We're, no, we're going to talk about what Thanksgiving has become, what it is today and what it ought to be to you. It's not really profit, profitable to go dig up the past in that regard. Obviously, certain holidays like Halloween, you can point to the past and say, that was wicked, that was evil, it's ungodly, and it still is today. And, you know, we ought to take this time of the year as we enter into Thanksgiving and then Christmas and use these holidays as opportunities to glorify God, to preach the gospel, and to be thankful Christians. We've been blessed in so many ways. In the rest of the world, it's a time where they spend their time being greedy, and we need to invest our time in other people. We need to worry not so much about what a holiday used to, to be, but rather what we can make it by humbling ourselves and being in the right spirit and the right attitude. And the title of my sermon tonight is Turkey, Greed, and Gluttony. And again, I want you to learn how you ought to behave as a Christian, how you ought to behave with a Thanksgiving spirit during this time of the year. Because really the tradition today has become very selfish. In America, Thanksgiving is a very selfish time. Thursday, that is the time to indulge yourself to overeat no self-control get whatever you want in fact get two of them and then while you're in the flesh friday morning why don't you go on down to best buy or walmart and, and enjoy some black friday right take that friday to overindulge overspend go into debt now for the rest of the year go into debt for many months to come and buying christmas presents for people and look most of the stuff they're selling frankly is junk it is junk. It will end up in the landfill before one year's time is complete. Most of it is plastic. It's crap. It's valueless. But yet people, ooh, it's shiny. Ooh, I want that. And listen, we need to be balanced. As Christians, we need to understand what God's attitude would be for us during this time of year. Look, Thursday ought to be a time of you fellowshipping with believers or with family and having a good attitude and a good spirit and looking for, for ways to please the Lord. And you can't do that through gluttony. And Friday, well, it's Black Friday, Black Soul Friday, right? Some of the ways people act, right? We shouldn't let that infect us and get us greedy of things we don't really need or desiring things that may hurt us in the long run. And, and you know, we need to have the right attitude about going into debt and what we want and what we do this time of the year. You know, and Black Friday, typically people will tell you that that phrase simply means that is when your retailers and your merchandisers, for the first time, now they're into the black. You know, they use red to note when you're negative, when your budget is in the negative, and say, well, this is the day that they can finally catch up and be in the black. Well, that's actually a spin. That's a lie. That's not what Black Friday means. That's not where it came from. Uh, you know, Black Friday today is a time when the rest of America goes into debt. I could really care less about these huge companies that sell you know, overpriced goods that have no true value. You know, the origin of Black Friday was actually in 1869, there was a run on the bank. There was a couple banksters that caused a gold run. And they bought a lot of gold. It's called a, today the, in the stock market, they call it a pump and dump. You pump up the value of something and then you sell it all off and you thereby siphon all the wealth of the investors. They see it on the move. Oh, that must be a good investment. They put all their money in it and then they siphon it off making hundreds of thousands of dollars more and then once everybody figure out what's going on, like musical chairs, somebody's left with nothing. And there were lives that were destroyed in 1869, and they called this the Black Friday because of what happened on the gold market, how, they, how the bankers conspired to steal money from people. 
And I don't think it's a coincidence that today, Black Friday, is when everybody goes into debt for more money than they should. They spend more money than they ought to. But I, I can't resist that sale. Don't you know they're selling 60-inch TVs for $200? you got to go get one. Well, the problem is there's only one. Right? They're advertising it, and you get down there, and it's like, well, that one's gone, but, man, we got a 50-inch for you, and it's only 350. Well, you're there, you stood in line for all those hours, right? Your covetousness, your greed overwhelms you, and you end up buying something you didn't want anyway. Exactly. And look, we have to be careful this type, time of year. We need to encourage people not to involve themselves in that banker conspiracy that wants to take all of our wealth. We need to stay focused on the Word of God. Yeah, I think we as Christians ought to hate Black Friday. Yeah. Amen, that's good. I think we really ought to. I mean, it, uh, these black soul corporations have an evil agenda and they want to hurt people and hurt the economy and they're doing it through promising you some shiny piece of plastic and it, it's worthless. You know, I mean, today it really is a disgusting display of Americanism, what Black Friday has become. It's just greed, it's pride, it's that's mine, I was here first. You know, and it's destroying children's view of finances, right, of needs and wants. It's destroying children's views of their very own parents when they see how the parents act. Children need to understand how to give thanks, how to be thankful, and Black Friday totally ruins that. They don't understand gift giving. You know, there, that old phrase, to look a gift horse in the mouth. Who's heard that phrase? Right? It, it, and it, what it means is, hey, here's a free horse. And you're like, well, I don't know how good are its teeth. You know what I mean? Well, it's a gift. Do you want it or not? And children today have that attitude because of the greed of Black Friday and the covetousness of America, where it's like, well, that's not the gift I wanted. Take it back. You better give me a receipt so I can really go get what I really want. And it, it's created a very sour attitude this time of year. You know, and there, there are people out there dying for a new TV. I am just so tired of looking at that 50-incher. I mean, I, I have to squint from, from you know, 30 foot away in my, in my game room. I'm getting tired of it. i got to go get that 60-inch. I want the 80-inch. We want the bigger. We want more. There are people dying for TVs today, and I, I don't just mean that figuratively. There's a website. It's called BlackFridayDeathCount.com. BlackFridayDeathCount.com. And for the past decade plus, they have been measuring the news, and they have links to all these articles in the news, and they have the stats, and they say there have been 10 people killed on Black Fridays because of shopping deals, and 111 people injured. Are you dying for a new TV? Is it hurting you because you can't go get those toys you really want? You can't get that Xbox, that PlayStation, whatever it is you desire, does it hurt you? It might hurt you to go get it. It might hurt you to stand in line for hours in the rain and the cold just to try to get something that you think you need. You can't live without it. And look, when you live with an attitude like that, you will never be satisfied even when you have the best. Even when you have the most, it's not good enough. You're always looking for something else. The grass is always greener. And we as Christians ought to have a better attitude than that. We ought, we ought to not let this time of the year to be about covetousness, the lust of the eyes, you know, overeating and the lust of the flesh, you know, uh, you know, just uh, indulging yourself and everything. We need to make sure that this Thanksgiving and even this Black Friday, if you go out shopping on Friday, it's not a sin. But look, don't be overwhelmed by the promises that the world is trying to make you, by the carrot they're trying to hang in front of your nose. It can corrupt your heart. Covetousness can, can cause you to judge improper judgment. And it's not about buying stuff. Buying stuff in life is not the goal. It's not about getting a better car. Yeah, but I saw, man, that Honda ad, I mean, it made that thing look real sharp. Sure did make my Ford look terrible, you know? Oh, man, I, I got to do something about that, yeah? Is it worth breaking your neck? Is it worth going into debt more than you want? Think about it. I mean, I mean, that's what their goal is to say, what you have, even though it's sufficient, it's no good compared to what we offer, right? They want to pervert your judgment. They want you to want something more. And as Christians, we ought not to do that. You know, the new car, a bigger TV, children, new toys. Listen, what you do, your children will do. And if you want your children to be honest and not desiring a bunch of stuff they don't really need, then you need to act that way as well. You need to teach your children to appreciate what they have and not just lust after stuff. Well, but Brother Fannin, that new phone I really want, it's on sale. They said if I just sign a five-year contract, I can get it at a better price. You know, well, is it worth it? You're going to pay more in the long run, and then watch, you'll break the screen in a year, and it's going to cost more to fix it than you got in your pocket. You know, don't go chasing these toys, these new electronics. It's funny, I, got a, I have a tablet at the house, and um, 
It's looking kind of rough. Bro Brother Ben saw this tablet when he visited the other day, and my wife gives me a hard time about it. It's got a busted screen. It's got tape over it. The, the stand is taped back together where a friend broke it. And I mean, it's looking like it got ran over. It's pretty bad. But the new one of that same model is $700. Now, well, you know what? This one works just fine. It only reboots every now and then, and I can pretty well see what I, I want to see. You know what I mean? We just don't let the kids play with it because of the glass flaking out of the screen, but you know, I can watch sermons on it. It's good enough for me, you know? And Brother Ben gave my wife some fire, some fuel to the fire on that one. Oh, it's time for a new one. Okay, well then you buy me one. You know, because that one's working just fine for what I need. You know, and we ought to have that attitude that sometimes it's okay to just have something old or that's not perfect, that's good enough, or that will do. Because covetousness will eat you up. Covetousness will cause you to have a bitter heart and to be greedy for stuff that you don't need, that you don't really want. And look, the, the Christian way ought to be not a desire for everything new. Amen. Look, the spirit of this world, it wants you to lust after stuff. Yeah. I mean, I don't care if you're in the Goodwill store or Walmart or Best Buy, you walk about down the aisle with a child and they're going to see something they want. They don't even know what it is. Ooh, it's pretty. Oh, come on, don't touch that. Leave it alone, right? Well, I don't know. Why do you want that? I don't know. What's it do? Let's open it. Let's buy it and find out why I want it, right? That ought to not be our attitude. We all, you know, that's very dangerous when you give your heart over to just wanting more and wanting more. You know, sometimes you just need to be content with what you have. Things, things and stuff in this world can steal your heart from God. They can steal your attention. And again, children will learn by the parent's example. We need to learn by example. That's what will happen in your family, and they're going to watch the way you act. So don't go in debt. You know, it's funny because I, I found something at Goodwill the other day, and I'm like, wow, this is one of the old versions. This is actually made out of real wood, and it's seven bucks. Perfect. That'll be a Christmas present for Naomi. That's perfect. Clean it up a little bit. Put it in a box. She'll love it. And she doesn't know whether it's new or old. To her, it's sufficient. And I looked it up. It was a $100 item that I found for $7. And you think about it, the average child today, don't you, there's this little plastic robot, and if you, if you just start it, it'll pick up blocks and move them, and then pick up more blocks. Wow, this is the toy of the year. How much is that? Oh, $150, because it's a robot. It's artificial. And Do you really need a $150 plastic robot that somebody's going to step on and destroy? Man, go get some Lincoln Logs. Go get some old wood toys. You know, get something that has some true value, something that can actually teach something, instead of teaching you to watch a robot. You know, hey, there, there's your future. Don't buy into that. <laughs> In Hebrews 13, 5, he says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. Be content with what you have. Be content with what you have. Don't let your conversation be with covetousness. Make sure what you're saying and doing, it's clear that you're not just always desiring something else. We expect that out of the world. But as Christians, we need to set the standard we need to do it different, especially this year, especially this time of year. Look, we need to learn how to be thankful. In Psalm 100, he says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Thanksgiving is a time to thank God for what he's done for you, for what you have in your life. For your spouse, the fact that they're healthy and they're alive. That they have their mental competency. For your children, that they're happy and healthy. For the grandparents that are still around. For the ability to know how to preach the gospel, you need to be thankful to God and use the gifts He's given you. Be thankful for what you have. Don't start looking for something else out there. There's no joy in the world. You'll never be satisfied. Well, what are you having for Thanksgiving this year? You guys having the big turkey? You having the fancy turkey? What if it's ham? What if you go to Thanksgiving dinner with somebody, with the family, and it's like, well, I, all I could afford this year was ham. Mom, how could, Dad, why didn't you go into that? Why didn't you go buy that big fancy turkey? Be content with such things as you have. Thanksgiving is about thanking God for what you do have, because this year I promise you this one thing. There are family members that are going to come together, and they're going to get angry over stupid stuff, and they're going to part ways, both thinking they're wrong, and somebody's going to die. And somebody else will be full of regret. And that, let it not be said of you as a Christian. You need to have the attitude, hey, you know what, I'll take whatever I get. Well, I mean, hey, I can't afford the turkey this year. Hey, go have some chicken. It's good enough. 
The tradition ought to be thanking God for what we have in family and in friends and in health. Not about the stuff. Not about what we can, let's show off and see how much food we can buy just to let it go to waste. You know, I was at somebody's Thanksgiving dinner one time and I saw one person just kind of beret another like, why, you've got the fake cranberry stuff. Uh-uh-uh, not at my dinner table. We always do the right. We got to do, we got to go get the real stuff. You wait right here. We're going down to the store. We're going to buy the cranberries. We're going to make the real sauce. The canned stuff won't work for us. What a sour attitude. Yeah. That's not what it's about. I could care less whether we have cranberry or not. I don't like the stuff that much. I, I really could care less whether we have it. Does it matter if you have a turkey or a ham or both? Or what if it's just chicken? It's good enough. Do you realize there's people all across America that will be working on Thanksgiving Day? They will not be spending time with their family and their employer will not feed them. They're not even going to give them a free chicken leg. You need to be thankful for the freedom and the blessings you have in your life and not overlook things. Yes, Look, you're here in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Look at verse number 4. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. He's saying you can eat whatever you want. Turkey, ham. Hey, it can be chicken. That's okay. It could be squirrel. Amen. I, I only got one amen out of that. Come on, what if it's squirrel? Be thankful you got some food to put in your belly. You know, eat the squirrel. Pray for the food and thank God. Look what he says here. Nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. That's what Jesus did. When he fed the multitude, he broke the bread, he gave thanks, and then they fed everybody. That's what he did with his disciples before he said, this is the cup of the New Testament, this is my body of the New Testament. He broke the bread, he gave thanks to the Father, and then they ate. And that's the same attitude we need to have. Look at the next verse, he says, For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. What is sanctified by the word of God and prayer? Food. What kind of food? Any kind of animal, more specifically, is what we're getting at here. Well, but Brother Fannin, I mean, if we really want to get back to our Hebrew roots, we won't have ham for Turkey Day. Well, you know, that's not really biblical. I want you to turn to Proverbs chapter 30. Those ordinances were for a time, for a reason, for a picture of things to come. And they have since been overthrown. And 1 Timothy chapter 4 is the best verse you can give to somebody that is in question of that. Every creature of God is good. And nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving and prayer. For it is sanctified, listen, by the word of God. What makes squirrel sanctified? Because in God's word, he said it's okay to eat whatever you want. It's by the word of God and the giving of thanks and prayer. You better pray over that squirrel. If you're having squirrel, boy, you better pray over it, all right? But when he says by the word of God, it says it in 1 Timothy 4 here. It also says it in Genesis 9 and Acts 10. Those are the key locations you can go to. Before those ordinances were established in Genesis 9, they get off of the ark. And it says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Everything that liveth. Well, what about pigs? Yes, they could eat pigs before the Levitical priesthood. That was acceptable in God's eyes. He just said, don't eat the blood. Acts chapter 10, you see the same thing where the sheet comes down to Peter and it, and it says, there was all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice unto him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. He goes on, he tells him what God hath cleansed, call thou not thou common. He says, don't say it clean. Don't say it's unclean. When God said it's okay to eat squirrel, don't say it's unclean. Yeah. Now, I think you have to cook it right, if I understand that correctly. But look, I promise we're not going to have squirrel tomorrow. All right. But I want you to understand something. People that try, well, we have to do it with turkey. You can't use ham. Or even those that try to make eating ham a religious like uh, no-go. You know, oh, we can't eat ham. Well, you know, hey, well, you're putting yourself under a law that was temporary and before that law in Genesis and after that law in Acts chapter 10 and according to the Word of God in 1, Thessalonians, 1 Timothy chapter 4, it is acceptable to eat anything. What God has given you is acceptable to eat and that's the attitude you need to have when you sit down to dinner. Amen. Oh no, mom's stuffing. Every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving and prayer. Just get a little and pray over it. Make sure you pray over it, okay? It'll be all right. <laughs> we need to be thankful for what we have. Be thankful for the food that you get. Be thankful for the gifts that you get, for the thought that somebody would go out of their way and try to get something to show their love to you and show that they like you, that they're satisfied with you. And even if you're not satisfied with that gift, you need to be thankful for what people try to do because they love you. 
And listen, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive anyway. The blessing is not that you'll give and it'll be returned unto you. The blessing is in giving. It is a blessing to give something to somebody and seeing them saying, wow, I, I, wow, thank you. God, God's got something supernatural there. How do you fight the greed? You give away. That's what God says. Yeah, but I want, I want, hey, why don't you give away? Why don't you do everything you can to avoid getting a gift and, and, and make sure you're taking care of of your family that really loves you that you know maybe you didn't buy them a gift last year because you know I mean we're family everybody knows yeah but you know so what so what if it's just a tradition that's what family does they spend time with each other they call each other they give them things to say I love you and we as Christians ought to be the best at showing our love even when it's family members that we might disagree with on certain things we need to be a good example to them look you're in Proverbs chapter 30 I want you to find verse number 8 I love this verse. We need to remember it. Proverbs 30, verse number 8. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. This phrase here is so important. Lord, don't give me Please don't give me less. Whatever in your will, I will trust that that's acceptable for me. That's convenient for me. That is sufficient for me. Well, what if you make more than brother so-and-so? That's up to God. What if you make less than brother so-and-so? Then I guess I need to be a better steward. I guess I need to be a better giver. I guess I need to get better at using the resources God has given me. I need to be better at walking with the Lord. Listen, listen what he says here. Give neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Being rich is not a sin. Now, the love of money is a sin. right? Being covetous is sin. Abraham had a lot of wealth. He would have been a millionaire by today's standards. Over 300 trained servants in his own household. That's a pretty big boss. That's a pretty big company. You find me any plumbing, electrical company around here that's got 300 employees, I guarantee they're making millions of dollars a year. I guarantee you. And listen, there's nothing wrong with being a Christian that's a leader that's righteous with the riches that God gives you. That's good stewardship. And we as the average guy, if you don't own a business today and you're just an hourly employee or a salary employee and you say, well, I'm, I'm the poor guy. Well, are you being fed with food that's convenient for you? Look at the next verse. He says, lest I be fool and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. Look, God doesn't want you to be so poor you have to steal to make it because then you're blaspheming the word. You're making his laws wrong. But notice he says, lest I be fool and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? A lot of people, when they get rich enough, you can, you can just hang it up. They're done with God. And we know this from knocking doors in the nicer neighborhoods. Oh, it's a three-car garage. If they answer the door, they don't want none. They're good. They're a Methodist. They're Catholic. They're whiskey paleon, right? They don't want what we have. They don't want the gospel. They're not worried about God. They got God right where they want him. Sitting in a box, sitting in a shelf, sitting at some idol somewhere, marginalized in their mind, easy for them to deal with, because they got all the riches of the world. Why would they need blessings from God? They've got their own blessings. So remember this verse. Whenever you're, I mean, if you're up or down, consider that it's of the Lord. The Lord may be blessing you greatly and giving you more than you've ever had. Be a wise steward. Doesn't mean you have to give it all away to, to please God. Use what you have the right way. If you have nothing and you say, Brother Fanny, you just don't know. I am living from paycheck to paycheck, and if I miss one, we're done. Look, feed me with food that's convenient for me. God is saying, okay, I'm trying to learn you to depend on me, not depend on the check. I'm trying to get you to learn to pray to me more and, and live more for me, and then I'll take care of the rest. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? Make sure you're making, making your life all about being a Christian life, and then he'll take care of the bills. He'll take care of you getting a promotion. He'll take care of everything. You have to learn to trust the Lord, and He will give you more. And you have to be a good steward of what He gives you. Go to Proverbs chapter 21. You know, a lot of people this time of year, oh yeah, feed me with food. I'm going on a diet. Next year sounds like a good time to go on a diet, right? How come it is every gym on January, boy, it's game buster. They are, they are knocking out the numbers. They're getting more people to sign up in January than any other time of the year. Look, in America, we're known for forswearing ourselves and not fulfilling that promise. I, I promise I'm going to go down there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. No, no, no. Don't say any of that. Don't forswear yourself. You know, everybody's ready for diet time. I even heard somebody, I was talking to an old client today in another, in another city, and he's, yeah, you know, I was just talking with my wife, and we said, 
Friday, that's a good time to start a diet. How about Thursday? Well, brother, how about Wednesday night? Look, we got, we got uh, I don't know, we must have 20 or 30 pies back there on the counter in the kitchen. <laughs> and, you know, I'm preaching about not being a glutton and not being greedy. But don't worry, to help you guys out, I, I, I wrote a, a sermon that will last about an hour and a half. So it'll really test you and get you ready. I'm just kidding. I intend to go short tonight, but I just want to help drive home this point that we need to not give in to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. It's better for us if we're willing to humble ourselves and say, I don't really need that. Just ask, I mean, do I really? What if I don't have it tomorrow? Would I be okay? What if you don't get that extra piece? Is it going to be okay? Or if I don't get the, I want the leg. I got to have the leg. I get the leg every year. Why don't you give it to somebody else that never gets it? Wouldn't that be better? Wouldn't that be a better reputation as a Christian, especially this time of the year? God doesn't want you to have to steal or lie. Forget him. You can't afford turkey. Eat chicken. It's okay. If you're blessed enough to have chicken, you don't have to have turkey. Now look, in, you're in Proverbs 21. Stay there for a second. So I, I just want to throw in this for a second. You know, credit is very dangerous. But credit is also necessary in a lot of ways in the world that we live in today. Because of how hyperinflation has destroyed our economy and the Federal Reserve banks have caused multiple crashes and then they give the banks lending power a fractional reserve. Oh, I have a dollar. I'll lend out 11 that don't exist. It's just zeros and ones on the computer. Inflation has devalued our purchasing power. And that's why, oh, we're going to go for a $20 minimum wage. Well, you idiot, that's going to make it a, a $5 dollar menu at McDonald's. They don't under, people don't understand simple economics. And unfortunately, most people do not have the funds for the basic things that they used to have, and therefore credit is very necessary. And as Christians, you know, we, we probably have to interact with credit and use credit, but we would be wise to avoid debt. We would be wise to avoid going into great debt. There are certain purchases that are needed, like cars and houses, that you may have to finance. You know, and but you could all well, but you know, I need a, I need an extra car right now. I'm looking at cars. There's the ten thousand dollar car, but I don't want the note. I'd rather get a two thousand dollar car and not have to go into debt. That would be more wise of me. I'd be a better steward of the resources I have because today, you know, I talked to the bank and they're, oh, Mr. Fannin, we will approve you right now, and you don't have any payments until January. Oh, okay, and then when it comes calling in January. I need to make sure I can afford the insurance and the car payment and the gas and all the extra expenses of what it would cause. You know, and credit is, it's a strange system and you know, they take a gamble on you. They are, they are betting that you're not going to pay it. Number one, the money doesn't exist. They're going to, I'll freely give you a thousand dollars. Me, a thousand dollars? Yeah, but don't worry. If you don't pay us back, we're going to get you at 26.99%. We're going to knock your brains out on, on, on interest. Right? And that's absorbent. That's ridiculous amounts of interest are being charged by these credits. And, and if you don't have very much credit worthiness, then they're going to give you a very high rate. In other words, they really want to get the money out of you. And we as Christians that are in this world, we would be wise to learn how to use credit better by not going into debt. You know, we had a brother that visited us from another state and he came down and he preached for us. And I didn't get permission, so I won't use his name. But Brother Jeff said he stayed in this hotel for free because of his points on his credit card. Well, how'd he do that? He had free credit. Well, a lot of the credit cards, because they're taking a gamble on you, will turn around and say, I'm gonna give you some incentive. I'll give you a reward. If you buy through us, we'll give you some free money, which nothing's free in this world. It's coming off the back of the other guy probably, but we'll give you points. And there's airline points the same way. I mean, every time you fly, they, they go around, they say, if you sign up for our credit card, we will give you 50,000 air miles. That's good for two one-way trip or, or two-way trips back and forth, right? So from, from here to the other side of the country and back twice. Well, that has a value of what? Several hundred dollars, four, five, six hundred dollars, depending on where you're going. How is it they're able to give this away? Well, through rewards, because you have to pay yearly fees. You have to spend such amount of money. So you're actually making their budget. Even if you use the credit card and pay it off quickly without paying any interest, that helps their books because of all the deadbeats they're carrying, they're willing to give you some points and let you earn rewards. That is something that is wise for Christians to do because you can use a little bit of credit and not go in debt and spend their money and then pay them back immediately and they will give you something in return. And then three months later, you can call them up and say, well, I've been a good boy, give me some more credit, right? Increase my limit. And what happens is your credit score gets better 
And then whenever you go to get a car or a house, then they're not giving you 26%. Then, whoa, wow, you're looking good. We'll give you 7%, we'll give you 10%, we'll give you 2% based on your credit worthiness. And listen, the banks are evil as hell. I, I mean, we could preach sermon after sermon about what's going on, the wickedness of just how they're founded and everything else. But I want you to be wise, ha have some wisdom of the world in that regard, that we need to not say we're going to do something and not do it. You don't borrow money and not pay it back. You should have a good reputation in the world. And if you owe money, you ought to, you ought to try to get out of that. Look at Proverbs chapter one or 21 where you're at. Look at verse 25. The desire of the slothful killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. You hear that? The desire of the slothful killeth him. It's, oh man, I want, I want, but if I can just get a little bit of credit. Look, do not let the incentive of credit or the incentive of reward from credit card companies destroy your credit reputation. Credit is not money. It has no value, but if you don't pay them back out of you, they will put a lien on you, they will hurt you. Look at the next verse. He that coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Coveteth greedy. The world is full of people that they want, they want, they want. They can't get enough. And as Christians, we ought not be that way. Look, he says, the righteous giveth and spareth not. The world is trying to figure out how to you get a new willing. Hey, you need 20 bucks? Here you go. Righteous, the righteous ought to do. Because a little credit can ruin you at the percentages that they charge. Go to the next chapter, chapter 22. Listen, it's better to own something than to owe somebody. Right? I would rather have that old busted up tablet that works pretty much all right than to go into debt to get a brand new tablet. It wouldn't make any sense. I don't use it well enough. I can't justify the expense. It's not like a business expense where it pays me for having it. You're, you're sometimes you're better off with that old thing. And look, cars are a little bit different. Houses are definitely different. You want to be able to protect your family. You want your family to be able to travel safely. Look at Proverbs 22. Look at verse number 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. You understand what it says here? If you're in debt, you're a slave. Yeah. You're a slave to the bank. Well, I got I to make that. I, if I don't make it by the 10th, oh man, then they charge me a $35 late fee, and then they charge me 26% interest, and then they charge me interest on the late fee and the interest they already charged me. Look, they're crooks. Understand what you're dealing with when you use credit and when you get yourself in debt, and be very careful. Because this time of the year, everybody wants to offer you a little bit of free credit. Just sign up now and don't worry. Sign up now, no payments until, hey, don't buy that lie. Look, if you can use that to your advantage and you can honestly pay it back and, and, and come out on, on top, you understand their system and use it, but don't be deceived by their promises. And whatever you do, don't go into debt. It can hurt your family. And look, we need to be honest and not greedy. You know, and credit cards, it's not like a money buffet. You know, I heard the old joke, oh, I got a check, I mean, I can just write checks all day long. You know, it's not free money. And credit card's not the same way. I got $1,000. No, you have $1,000 times 26% interest, times, times, times. You have to see it for what a worst case scenario is. And be wise. Go to Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. In Psalm 37, it says, The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. We need to be giving. We need to be showing mercy. We don't need to be wicked and say, well, I'll, I'll get this thousand dollar credit card now and I'll say, forget them next year. I just won't pay it off. That's their problem. That's not right. A Christian should not do that. A Christian, their word should be their bond. Because listen, God hates lying. God hates it when you make a vow and you don't keep it. Even if you're making the vow to a dishonest banker. If you go out as a born again, Bible believing Christian and you, you make a lie to a bank, about giving them money, you know you're not going to do it. God will judge you for lying. Yeah. God should judge you for that. And you don't want God's judgment on your life. So we need to hate being in debt. And we do that by hating greediness. Hate the greediness in this world because it will hurt your life. You know, in the perfect Christian world, if everything were the way it ought to be, we would be able to help each other out and we wouldn't have to borrow. It talked about that in the Old Testament. It had statutes that they would they would lend and not borrow in Ephesians 4 he says let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him 
that needeth. It's better for us to give. And I'm not saying this because I want y'all to give me stuff. I don't want stuff. Please don't buy me a Christmas present. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. That's just how I don't, I tell my wife, you're not allowed to get me stuff. Now I'm, I'm going to try to spoil her, but I want you to understand the blessing is in giving, not in greed. Greed will destroy your heart. It'll pervert your mind. And God wants us to be blessed. And covetousness causes us to kill our responsibilities and have, have a, a wrong judgment. You know, in Luke 16, he said, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. And look, if you're faithful in the little bit that you have, God will give you more. And if you, and if you help those with what God gives you, God will give you more. God wants you to be wise in all aspects. You're in Exodus 13. We're going to look here about how Jethro, who was Moses' father-in-law, saw what he was doing. He's setting up to judge everybody. Everybody's coming to him. Look at verse number 13, Exodus 18, 13. The Bible reads, And when it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat down to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from the morning to the evening, and when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why sittest thou thyself alone, and all the people stand by thee from morning unto even? Right? Look, this is the court system. If you've ever had to go to court for anything or been through that process, you're going to sit there from morning to evening. You're going to waste a bunch of time. Right? And he, he sees this. He's like, what are you doing? Look, he says, what are you doing to these people? Why are you putting these people through this? People need judgment, but they need righteous judgment. And I love who he picks as judges. That's why we're here. I want you to see this. He says, thou thing that thou doest is not good. Look at verse 21. Moreover, Thou shalt provide out of all of the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and placing such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. Look, we need to hate debt. We need to hate credit and greediness and covetousness and all the problems it causes. He says here, these men fear God they're known as men of truth, and why? They hate covetousness. They hate covetousness. Could it be said of you that if a coworker came to you and said, look at this car. Man, this is the new car. It's got the new, look at this, look at this woman. Look at anything, and you're like, wow, yeah, I want, that's cool, I want. Look, we as Christians need to be men of truth, men of righteousness. We need to hate covetousness, and when the world tries to put something in front of you to cause you to not appreciate what you have, we need to be content with such things as we have. These men were called to judge out an entire nation. God established these men and through it, the nation thrived. They didn't have to sit around and wait for judgment. These men were taught the laws and the statutes and they were known for hating covetousness. As a Christian, this time of year, let it be said of you that you hate covetousness. Amen. Boy, but if you'll just take, if you'll sign up for I don't want to sign up for it. I don't want what you're promising me. I'm happy with what I have, and I'm not going into debt. Yeah. I'm not going to be greedy. I'm, I'm happy with what I have. Go to Proverbs chapter 23. That's the type of judges God wants. That's right. And we as men of truth, that's the type of judges we need to be in our own lives first, so then we can judge the world. So then when that family member comes to you and they say, but look at this, that new car, that new thing, it's got this, it's got that, it's got all the bells and the whistles, you can turn to them with honesty and truth and judge and say, the car you have is doing fine. Right. You're safe. It runs well. It's paid off. It's good enough. Amen. Give them some wisdom and say, don't go into debt. God wants us to judge amongst the world, and it starts by not being covetous of everything else the world wants. We have to be in balance. In Mark 4, he, he warned, he said, and these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, now these people are saved, he says, and the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the world and becometh unfruitful. If you want to be an unfruitful Christian, then you can desire other things. You can go after all these other things and go after riches and the cares of the world and you will be unfruitful. But if you say, I want to be a mighty man of God and I want to look for rewards, not just from a credit card company, but rewards from my Father in heaven, then you need to start hating covetousness. And you need to make sure that the cares of the world, and as he said, the things, the lusts of other things, do not get in the way of you serving God. 
Because that's how the devil knows how he, he can get you with that. If he can get you more worried about your job and your credit, that you stop serving God, then the devil has succeeded. You're already too busy to open your mouth. <laughs> you know, many Christians, tomorrow, I'm sorry, Friday, Black Friday, I, I almost thought about going and doing one of those man on the street interviews, take a camera and a mic, and find out who's actually saved. You know, I really ought to just go preaching the gospel. I got a captive audience, right? But I bet you most people don't want to hear it, right? But if you went and interviewed, you find out there are, there are people that really are saved that are going to stand in line on Black Friday for six hours till midnight. So it opens up. I got to hurry and eat this turkey so I can run off and stand in line. I want to be the first one. I got to get that big TV. That's all I can think about. There are Christians that will stand in line on Black Friday, that will go in debt on Black Friday, they'll waste their life away, and guess what they can't do? Sit in church for an hour. They can't just sit still and listen to the Word of God. We had a visitor while I was gone, apparently, uh -oh. and I, I called him because he left early. And I said, well, so tell me about yourself. Well, you got a great website. I found you through your website. I agree with everything I saw. It was awesome. Cool, okay, so have you watched this online? No, 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 we, I just came in town for a football game. Red flag. Uh-oh. Where's your priorities at, right? So and I said, well, how was the preaching? How did Brother Theo do? Well, I mean, you know, he went a little long. It was a lot longer than I expected. Now, he wrote his church, his home church on the card. I'm going to look it up. I should have looked it up, but it probably doesn't matter. I guarantee it's 20 minutes pep talk, a pat on the back, come on down to the altar, and go to the buffet. Yeah. Brother Theo preached for an hour about having a healthy family, about how the, the role of moms and dads and husbands and wives. And I, it was a great sermon. I enjoyed it. I wonder if that family will be in line for Black Friday, because they sure won't have their butt in church. They're not willing to sit in church for an hour. Oh, this is too much. Are you kidding me? What are these people doing? They're just going to sit around and listen to preaching? Yes, we love God. We love the Bible. I desire the Word of God. I don't desire new shiny toys that will end up being worthless in six months. We as Christians need to get our head on our shoulders. Don't be greedy. Be righteous. We're going to take a glance at, at gluttony here, then we'll be done. Right before we eat the pie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, guys, I had to do it because I love you. I rebuke you, right? You're in Proverbs 23, is that right? Are you guys there? Yeah. Proverbs chapter 23, look at verse number 19. Hear thou, my son, and be wise, and guide thine heart in the way. Verse 20. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. Riotous eaters of flesh. I mean, it sounds like, a, I mean, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> that's what I expect to see at the buffet down here. Look what he says, for the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. God says a drunkard and a glutton are on the same level. It's somebody that can't control themselves. It's somebody that's used to giving the flesh whatever the flesh wants. The Apostle Paul warned us about that battle, that war in your members. My spirit wants to do the right thing. My flesh wants to do the wrong thing. These people say, forget the spirit. Who's got time for spiritual things? There's food. There's wine. Let's get drunk. Let's be a glutton. Look, as Christians, it's thought not to be said of us. We need to be very careful. And look, I'm not trying to ruin your Thanksgiving. I'm not trying to ruin your pie fellowship. But I want you to consider that God gives you the power of the Holy Spirit to help you have more self-control. And if you'll be faithful in the little things then you'll have more self-control in the bigger things. If you say, well, Lord, there's that thing I keep stumbling with. I keep failing, Lord. I need some help. And he says, how about your food? When's the last time you fasted? Well, no, I'm not worried about that, Lord. I'm not talking about food, Lord. I'm talking about that other thing. He says, no, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about the little things. Men, let's get the, let's get the little things in order, and God will give us bigger things. He'll give us more victories and more power over our mind and our heart. Let's give victory over covetousness in our life. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. That comparison of, 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 of being a drunkard and a glutton, you know, they accused Jesus falsely of that same thing. In Deuteronomy 21, it talked about where their son, he said he was stubborn and rebellious. It said, he will not obey our, our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Right? People like to say, oh, that's a child. No, that was a man. That was a young man right. under the authority of the parents. The parents said, look, this teenager turned out to be rebellious, Mouthy, stubborn, 
a drunkard and a glutton, according to God's law, you should put him to death. Now, we don't do that today, but listen, uh, hey, we need to die to the flesh. You understand, you are a spiritual judge. We judge all things in the spirit. Therefore, you and your spiritual man, you need to judge that fleshly man of yours. You need to give the new man some power and give in on the little things. Don't keep giving in to that same thing and God will give you bigger and bigger victories. You know, the Bible also says to eat for strength and not for drunkenness. You can eat yourself drunk. There's a lot of things you can give into the flesh and it's the same as not being sober. You're essentially drunk. You're in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Find verse number 1. Verse number 1, the Bible reads, I said in mine heart, Go to now, I will prove thee with mirth. Right, mirth means partying, a good time. He's, he's saying to his heart, I'm going to find out what partying is all about. Now understand, he has all the wisdom in the world, and through his wisdom he says, I want to understand why the fool does what the fool does. So he does what the fool does, and then he says, well, that was pretty stupid. I get the same result the fool got. Right? What he found out was the flesh is susceptible to all these things. And here at this point he's saying, all right, heart, let's find out what partying's all about. Let's see what a good time, just chasing after a good time. He says, therefore, enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. Vanity means empty, worthless, hollow. Not, uh, vanity is like, it's not good. It's not, there's no real gain there. It's worthless to you. And look, it's almost like he's saying, Let's, I'm going to learn misery by searching after a good time. And he found it. You know? And we as Christians, we need to stay balanced in this. Look at verse number 10 in this chapter. Look what we can learn from him here. Verse number 10. And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy. For my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. Now look, this is a fleshly statement here. Whatever my eyes can see. Now look, I can't see your spirit. I can't see your soul. That's who you really are. We as Christians, that's what the battle is all about. Now King Solomon, as a leader, he failed because he let strange wives into his household and they brought their strange gods. Well, how did they get in? Well, it says right here, whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. The lust of the eyes. The Bible warns about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And his heart from any joy, I found all the joy that I wanted, but it's not true joy. It's not spiritual joy. It's temporary. It's short term. Look at the next verse. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. He's saying, what I got in the flesh, I thought was joy in the flesh, was really vexation. It made me miserable. It made me eh, not so joyous anymore. Dissatisfied, ultimately. Now look, he was saved. And he was testing the flesh here. He was learning of fleshly things. Notice he says, under the sun. He says, there is no profit under the sun. In all these things, I took all the wives I wanted. I took all the riches I wanted. I had all the buildings built I wanted. I got all the food from all the different parts of the world. I got all I wanted. And there was no profit under the sun. You as Christians, Solomon as a Christian, he has profit above the sun. It's called rewards in heaven. And what he's saying here, when you search after things for the flesh, you have something that will not last forever. You have something that's temporary, it's hollow, it's vain, it will make you miserable because you never really get satisfied from it. Right. Look at verse 18. Yea, I hated all my labor which I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that shall be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be a wise man or a fool? Yet shall he have rule over all my labor wherein I have labored. And wherein I have showed myself wise under the sun, this also is vanity. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 and we're done. This also is vanity. What's he saying? I worked, I got, it's no good, I wasn't that happy. The things that matter are the things that last forever. 
preaching the gospel and saving souls. That is above the sun. That is something that will last forever. It is not vain. It is not worthless. It is not vexation of spirit. That is true joy. Amen. Listen, this time of the year as Christians, we need to make sure we're not covetous. We're not greedy. We're not gluttonous. We're not worried about what we get. We're, willing about, we're worried about what we can give. Hey, if I could give somebody a $20 gift card and it would open a door for me to preach the gospel, I would. But we're not like other churches where we're, oh, come on, we're going to feed everybody and then we're going to preach and repent of your sins. Look, it's not about giving away in the flesh. It's about giving away in the spirit is what Solomon learned. He learned it the hard way, unfortunately. We can learn from his wisdom and through his writings that God wants us to not worry about so much the things in the flesh. He'll provide for those. You're his child. You're not going to have to beg for bread. You're saved. Now start worrying about the things that last forever. Start preaching the gospel. Make that a priority. Worry about the growth and the spiritual things in your family. Amen. We're almost done here. Eternal reward. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse number 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. When you're sitting at the dinner table with your unsaved friends, your unsaved family members, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It's like He's at your right hand. He's in you. He's above you. He's all around you. He wants you to be a witness. Yeah. There's an opportunity to preach the gospel in the living room. They're, they're asking about Grandpa that died. I wonder if he went to heaven or hell. But you're after that last piece of pie. You failed. There's an opportunity for you to be a witness and let your moderation be known unto men. But you know, it's, it's the holiday. It's just one beer. It's just one, just a little bit of, no. Be strong in the spirit and God will reward you. This time of the year, we're going to be tempted and tried in every way that the devil can throw at us. Or, I mean, his, his devils, his minions are out there working. They're in your friends, they're in your family, they're ruining their lives and they want to get to you. And this is an opportunity for you to rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord by showing your moderation. Look at the next verse. Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. Don't be caring about something. If you go to bed dreaming about, man, maybe I can buy that car, maybe I can get that computer, that toy, that fill in the blank, I just need that one more thing. You're being careful. You're caring about something else. Instead, rather, he says, let your prayer and your supplication, Lord, I need you to supply I'm asking with thanksgiving. Thank you for what I already have. And if you see fit that this is good enough and I don't need any more, thank you for what I have. Amen. That's the right attitude this time of year. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He will give you true peace in your heart. He will give you the understanding. Sometimes you don't understand why things happen until it's over. And then you go, oh, I get it. It all makes sense now. The Lord has revealed it to me. He will keep you sane. He will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what should we focus on instead as Christians? Look, look at the last verse here, verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and there be any praise, think on these things. Be righteous this time of year. Don't be covetous. Don't give in to the greed. Don't give in to the gluttony. Find things that are true, that are pure, that are just, that are right in God's eyes. Let, let Him be your judge. Worry about Him, not what your neighbors think you're driving or how much you paid for this or that. Let God give it to you. Let God bless you with it. You know, in Hebrews 13, I read this earlier, I'll read it again. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. So we can boldly say, I don't care if I have a new car or not. The Lord is my provider. He'll get me there and back and he will provide. I'm content with what I have. The Lord protects and provides through it. I'm happy with it. It's good enough. Amen. Feed me with food that's convenient for me. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for our time we get to spend together tonight. Lord, help us to be thankful for the blessing that you provided just of having a great church and great friends. 
Lord, thank you for the food in the back that we get to fellowship over, Lord. I pray that you would help us to have a positive heart. Help us to have true joy in this life by searching after you. Lord, I pray that you would give us the wisdom this time of year to judge righteously and to hate covetousness. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.